Very few Star Trek foes are out and out one note monsters. Most antagonists tend to have at least one saving grace. Sometimes, however, the deeds of a character, organisation, or even an entire species go so far beyond the pale that they airlock any chance at redemption they may have had, probably along with a few of their victims. Well, with that in mind, I'm Ellie for Trek Culture, and these are the 10 most irredeemable Star Trek villains. Number 10 The Augments. Very much a product of their time, Kar Noonien Singh and the Augments, as they later came to be called, were Star Trek's exploration of the 20th century's most destructive set of beliefs, eugenics. These particular villains were the result of humanity's experiments with DNA resequencing, the double helix structure of DNA having only been discovered about a decade and a half before Space Seed was first broadcast. In the late 20th century, the Augments conquered and enslaved the world. The resulting eugenics wars between them and the regularly DNA had cataclysmic consequences for Earth. An estimated 35 million people were left dead before the dictatorial supermen were deposed. All remaining Augment embryos were put on ice, and Khan and about 80 of the other overambitious Clark Kents were sentenced to death. They managed to skip town and the solar system, however, aboard the SS Botany Bay before execution day. The 90s were wild, man! In 2267, Khan and co made an ultimately unsuccessful attempt to commandeer the Enterprise, but Kirk let them off with little more than a slapped wrist, a teeny tiny terraforming project, and one Marla MacGyvers. Afterwards, neither Kirk nor Starfleet stopped by for a SETI Alpha high five, and things went from bad to worse on the planet. Khan, of course, would return to seek vengeance in the film that sports his name. In that movie, and not before a lot of Eerials and Moby Dick, Khan and the other Augments went the way of the Old Testament. Knowing his death slash rebirth as a rock was coming, Khan solidified his status as irredeemable villain by using using his last moments to quote Melville's relentless captain, From hell's heart I stab at thee, for hate's sake I spit my last breath at thee. Naturally, a couple of members of the Sung family were also involved in all this along the way, but more on that later. Number 9, Section 31. Perhaps the reason Section 31 is so beyond redemption is that they have never really sought it in the first place. More amoral than immoral, there is a certain unfeeling pragmatism to the organisation that just wants to get the dirty, but objectively necessary job done. Such cold rationale and dubious use of Cicero can hardly hold water for long, however. There are rules in war and especially especially for peace. Chronologically speaking, the earliest we see of Section 31 is through Malcolm Reed's involvement in the organisation. However, the Shady Group's first on-screen appearance was in Star Trek Deep Space Nine, to spend time with Bashir on the holodeck. Convinced the Doctor wasn't a Dominion spy, Director Sloan tried the recruitment pitch. Sure, it's a super dangerous job, you'll have to lie to everyone you know and love, and check your principles at the door, but you get one of those cool black jackets just for signing up. Section 31 was an open secret once more, and Starfleet Command didn't deny denying it. After the Inquisition, the group appeared in DS9 on a few more occasions. Oh, and there was that attempted genocide thing. I bet that'll never come up again. In Star Trek Discovery, almost everyone seems to have heard of Section 31. Far from operating autonomously of no fixed abode, as in Sloan's day, in the 23rd century, Starfleet maintained at least a degree of oversight over Section 31, and the organisation had its own HQ. Starfleet Admirals submitted reports to Section 31's AI system control. Its operatives sometimes served openly aboard Starfleet vessels, and they weren't shy about showing off their fancy advanced technology either. Ooh, com badges! Section 31 maintained its cruel streak all the same, hiring a former Terran Emperor and hunting down Spock just so they could scramble his neurons. Control almost wiped out all sentient life in the galaxy, but that was probably nothing compared to what was on those pads in Sloan's slowly exploding mind palace. Soon we'll be getting a long trek look at all the clandestine goings on in a movie with Michelle Yeoh. Who else is excited for that? Number 8, Ducat. We were never going to warm to the guy. He was the last prefect to oversee the brutal occupation of Bajor before, much to his chagrin, Cardassian withdrawal in 2369. There aren't many ways to spin it. If it walks like a fascist dictator, talks like a fascist dictator, then it's probably mononymous tyrant Ducat. And never forget, he killed Jadzia in cold blood. It was in Deep Space Nine's waltz that, just in case you hadn't twigged before, Ducat's true depravity was revealed for all to see. As he descended into the madness of evil, he ceased the slow dance around his feelings for the Bajorans. In the season 6 episode, he poured out his vile hatred to Sisko, saying, From the moment we arrived on Bajor, it was clear that we were the superior race. I hated them. I should have killed every last one of them. I should have turned their planet into a graveyard, the likes of which the galaxy had 
had never seen. In spite of this sickening diatribe, the character retained a surprising level of popularity amongst fans. As related in the Star Trek Deep Space Nine companion, some fans on the internet went so far as to defend Dukat's actions during the occupation, and this apologia for genocide shocked the show's writers and producers. They, as well as Mark Alimo, who played him, had tried to make Dukat a fully rounded character. But there should have been no room for ambiguity in the fact that he was the despicable despot of the piece. By DS9's finish, Dukat had disguised himself as a member of the species he so despised in order to curry favour with the next miscreant on this list. Then, somewhat fittingly, he wound up in Bajoran Hell. Number 7. Win Adami Admittedly, this Ranjan, then Vedic, then Kai wasn't all bad. She had a few things going on for her. During the occupation, she risked her life and was imprisoned for preaching her faith and saved a number of lives, once by bribing a Cardassian officer to divert a transport of Bajorans headed for execution. Plus, perhaps if the Prophets, presumably because they'd already seen her entire career path, hadn't wanted her to end up siding with the Costa Mojan, they might have not let it go to Celestial Temple voicemail every time she tried to call. Still, in spite of the above, and after carefully considering her turncoat tactics in the fire caves, switching sides really only because Dukat had gained the upper hand, Win Adami remains a character past the point of redemption. She stabbed poor Solba quite literally in the back, for profit's sake, and did so in the more metaphorical sense to plenty of others who got in her way. Win shunned Sisko from the very beginning, unwilling to accept until a lot later that a non-believer could be designated emissary of the prophets. She fought Keiko O'Brien for teaching science, which was all just a ruse to try to assassinate Vedic Ryle, further connived her way to becoming Kai, took credit where none was due, and sent in the militia over a few reclamators. Later, she interrupted the reckoning and then nearly set Bajor and the rest of the galaxy on fire by attempting to release the par rates. Number 6. The Sphere Builders This video isn't using kill count as a measure of everlasting evil, but still. This band of problematic aliens from another plane were behind an attack on Earth that cost 7 million lives, including the sister of one chief engineer. That was just their warm-up act, however. The Sphere Builders had convinced the Zindi to finish the job of humanity's eradication. Depending on how you think about time, none of this should have ever happened, but it did. One of the fiendish factions of the Temporal Cold War, the Sphere Builders had spied a future they didn't particularly like, in which they were sent packing back to their realm by the Federation in an alternate 26th century. As the crew of the NX-01 found out in the 22nd century, the species' goal was to transform space in our universe into their own trans-dimensional playground by using the gravimetric energy generated by a vast network of humongous spheres. Had they not been stopped, the spatial transformations in the expanse would have grown to encompass hundreds of systems, with disastrous consequences for any inhabited worlds in their path. You can't really get more irredeemable than an attempt at galaxy-level genocide just so you can move into the neighbourhood. Number 5. A Selection of Sungs So far in Star Trek, essentially all we've seen of the Sung dynasty is a succession of scientists, one more zany than the last. In amongst the often endearing and inventive oddity lies the family's darker side. A couple of Sungs whose dastardly deeds are greater than Noonien's penchant for puns. The first of the long lineage we've met is Dr. Adam Sung in the early 21st century. In an alternate timeline where Rene Picard never brought back some clever bacteria from Europa, it was Adam who saved humanity from the effects of climate change with his flying force field contraption. Nevertheless, he became a part of the sinister Confederation of Earth, and even invented its racist slogan, a safe galaxy is a human galaxy. In the variant 25th century, this Sung had statues erected in his honour. After the La Sirena gang arrived in 2024 to fix the mess, Adam Sung teamed up with the still very resistance is futile Borg Queen Gerati, sent off some soldiers for assimilation, and then went to try to murder Rene, killing Talon the Traveller instead. Plus, he had been holding on to a little something called Project Khan. Just over a century later, the Sung family produced another Doctor of Genetics of dubious ethics, Arik Sung. Taking up his ancestor's interest in augments, Arik stole some of the embryos that had been on ice since the 90s from Cold Station 12 to make some modifications of his own and raise the result as his children. As adults, these augments went on a murderous rampage to free the rest of their fellow enhanced, and Arik caught up with them to lend a hand. Number 4. The Blue Gills They only ever appeared in one episode of Star Trek, aside from a mention by those butt-bug conspiracy theorists in Lower Decks, but they've had us checking the backs of our necks ever since. These terrifying, nightmare-inducing parasitic creatures wormed their way into the highest ranks of Starfleet Command and turned dinner time into a horror show. An infected Admiral Quinn did get in some impressive high kicks though for his years, so perhaps it's worth giving them a try. And uh, Admiral? Bit embarrassing? 
missing, but your stunt double is showing. Thoroughly alien, it is the manner in which the bluegills go about their villainy that makes them so irredeemable. They enter through the mouth and take complete control of a victim's mind and body, yet still claim, we mean you no harm, we seek peaceful coexistence. Yeah, yeah, and Wolf's a pacifist now. They also didn't hesitate to blow up an entire starship and crew once its captain was onto them. And let's spare a thought for poor old Commander Remick. He had to have their mother inside him, only for his head and chest to be phasered off. Picard and Riker must have been in therapy for months. It's tough to see these little and one large blue buggers ever changing their ways. Number 3. Maxwell and Other Burks Towards the end of the Star Trek Voyager 2 part at Equinox, Captain Janeway walks down the line of remaining reprobates from the now destroyed ship of the episode title, citing their names as she strips them of rank. This time you'll have to earn our trust, she says. Dismissed. There are a few faces missing from this perp parade, however. Most notably absent, for the purpose of this list, is a certain commander with Lieutenant Pips. I stalk my exes halfway across the galaxy, Maxwell Meatball Burrito Burke. He was slimy and sly from the start, getting arsy with Janeway when she wanted to make a stand on Voyager and giving us full-on facepalm cringe during his reunion with Balana. There was something just not quite right with this first officer. When his captain, Rudolph Rudy Ransom, finally decided to stop committing murder to rev up the warp engines and surrender to Voyager, Maxwell mutinied and took a gaggle of fellow Barclays with him to the slaughter. In the end, the four bridge insurrectionists try to escape to the Equinox's one remaining shuttle, but the aliens catch up with them. The last we see of Burke is his rapid desiccation death as the wronged interspatial lifeforms take their nucleogenic vengeance. Number 2. The Orion Syndicate To be clear, and so as not to let Tendi down, we're not saying all Orions are wrongins, just the ones who are. There are certainly a lot of femme fatale stereotypes out there about the species dating back to the first Star Trek pilot, and which have only recently begun to be deconstructed. It's really the Orion Syndicate and future rebrand that gives the rest the bad space pirate name. The Orion Syndicate was one of the worst, or at least the most organised, criminal gangs in the galaxy. By the 22nd century, when the NX-01 had a run-in with them near Klingon space thanks to the handiwork of two of the other entries on this list, several members of Archer's crew were captured and auctioned into slavery before being rescued. If you'd like to poll though, you can always kick the Syndicate in the Brussels sprouts. In the 24th century, the Orion Syndicate had expanded its membership to include a smorgasbord of criminals of different species. Notably, Chief O'Brien was once sent undercover by Starfleet Intelligence into a section of the Syndicate on Fabius Prime to root out an informant. The consequences of this mission would follow the Chief, leading him a year later to investigate the family of Esri Dax, who had become embroiled with the nefarious organisation. In the post-burn world of the 32nd century, the Syndicate got a makeover and a nodding name change to become the Emerald Chain. Much like their forebears of the 24th century, the chain was a multi-species enterprise, with a green lady at its helm, the Orion Osira. Thorn in the side of the Federation and the Discovery, Osira and the chain relied on the most brutal methods of control. Slave labour was enforced by explosive implants, and anyone who tried to oppose or simply got in the way was either left without antennae or fed to an oversized worm. Osira did get her comeuppance, however, at the end of Michael Burnham's phaser rifle, and never insult a man's cat. She's a queen. Number 1. The Borg Queen Given the events of the final season of Star Trek Picard, we've already discussed the Borg Queen quite a lot, but it would be difficult to do a list about irredeemable villains without including Her Majesty on it. In Season 2 of Picard, we got a semblance of a hint that the, or rather a, Queen could mend her ways. Even then, it was only with the persuasive skills of Dr. Agnes Gerati that this alternate timeline Queen could be convinced a kinder collective was the future. Moreover, in that Queen's home universe, humanity was arguably the far greater villain. Back in our regular reality, and as the role requires, the Borg Queen has always been quite open in expressing just how awesome she thinks assimilation is. What makes the Borg and the Queen so terrifying, after all, is that psychopathic absence of empathy as they make you one of their own. We did catch a glimmer of light for one incarnation of the prime Borg Queen in the Star Trek Voyager feature-length episode Dark Frontier. When Her Royal Highness rumbles Seven of Nine's attempt to help a group of species 10026 escape assimilation, she at first tries to to recapture the fleeing vessel. Strangely, Seven's subsequent pleas for mercy don't fall on deaf ears as the Queen lets the ship go. This may simply have been a scheme to win over her would-be protégé, or perhaps a spark of something a little deeper. Either way, for her return in Season 3 of Picard, the Queen is all Borg business, seething with anger towards Starfleet and the Federation, and ready to 
get some high-end revenge. And that concludes our list. Now, we are so close to 300,000 subscribers, so if you've just watched this video and realised you haven't yet clicked that subscribe button, then please go do it now. And a big, big thank you to that nearly 300,000 of you who already have. Also, make sure you're following us on the various social media platforms, and if you fancy giving this video a like, then I wouldn't say no to it. I've been Ellie for Trek Culture. I hope you have a wonderful day and remember to boldly go where no one has gone before.